Hi everyone. Uh, so uh, first, yeah. So I'm very impressed with the with the, the very big audience here, and as you said, like it's growing every every month. Uh, uh, the, the amount of interest and expertise that we have in Calgary in the, the, the field of artificial intelligence. Today I will be presenting uh, how, how deep learning is transferring cardiac, uh, cardiac imaging and I will share some of the results of our work at uh, Circle Cardiovascular Imaging. Uh, with me, I, I, I won't go to too much detail, technical detail and deep learning and uh, machine learning. With me, I have also Amin standing over there, maybe after, after the talk when, when we go to, the, to our, our uh, corner. If you have any more advanced technical questions, we are happy to, to help you there. So uh, before uh, talking about cardiac imaging and uh, how, how we are using deep learning uh, to, to basically help our workflow, I would first want to talk about Circle Cardiovascular Imaging. So Circle Cardiovascular Imaging is a Calgary-based company uh, that uh, we basically develop softwares for post-processing uh, cardiac CT and MR images to evaluate and analyze data and to help doctors uh, for, for their decision making. Circle was founded in 2007 when two of our, uh, the, the software creators, Dr. Friedrich and Dr. Barco, uh, met our uh, more two of our business uh, side people, Greg and, and Kelly, actually, who is also with us today. And, uh, he presented uh, in the, the second uh, meetup, I, I think it was the second one. So it was 2007 and then uh, basically it, uh, we have been growing and you know, so like going to, to different uh, like uh, basically starting from cardiac MR and then also like advancing to CT uh, and 4D flow images. But uh, so uh, c cardiac MR and basically like w w why cardiac MR and you know so I will start with heart failure and basically the heart failure it means that the, the heart muscle is uh, is damaged or weakened and it's unable to pump blood efficiently and as you see here uh, basically it affects uh, the the, the uh, like thousands of hundreds of thousands of Canadians and uh, every, every year around like 50,000 Canadians uh, also are, are diagnosed with, with heart failure. But uh, basically I also have a, a, a schematic of the heart there. So for the, for the beginning I want to introduce some of the, the terminology that I will be using throughout the talk here. Uh, so as you see we have the left ventricle I will, I will point here, so left ventricle, we have right ventricle, so basically the blood uh, that is deoxygenated from, the, from all the body goes to the right atrium and then flows to the right ventricle, goes to the, to, the, to the lungs, and then the oxygenated one comes to the left atrium and then to the left ventricle and is pumped to the, to the whole body. So left ventricle basically is the main chamber that is pumping blood all to the, like, to, to the entire body. And to, 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 to have a measure or, you know, so have some sort of biomarker for heart, heart failure, uh, what we want to basically looking at is uh, ejection fraction and to also introduce that or uh, what, what I have here. So basically imagine that we have a heart beeping, beating and then uh, so in, in time, basically there are different time points to that, to that beating heart. There is this uh, end diastolic uh, phase that basically heart is at its, uh, its maximum uh, maximum volume here and it's also the end systolic phase that the heart has pumped the blood out and it's at, the, at its minimum uh, volume. So what we need to to as a some sort of measurement for, for heart failure what we can measure so we have the end diastolic volume basically the volume of the heart at its, uh, at its biggest volume the, the end systolic volume the volume at its smallest and if we, uh, we uh, look at the difference basically we have the stroke volume how much blood is pumped out of the heart in every cardiac cycle once we have the car like this uh, stroke volume we can normalize it and then we can have the ejection fraction basically uh, the, the, the fraction of the blood that is pumped outside the, uh, the left ventricle in every cardiac cycle. For healthy controls, if you ask, uh, the, the ejection fraction is between 55 to 70 percent. Uh, so basically 55 to 70 percent of the blood that goes into the heart is pumped outside. So the goal is to help clinicians make timely and accurate diagnosis with uh, these measurements. What we have as a tool basically is cardiac MR that allows the, the, the physicians to look at the heart in different, different angles. So we have what, what I'm showing you here is the long axis uh, view of the heart. Basically you can see the different chambers of the heart, the atria as we were looking before and then the left ventricle and right ventricle. Uh, what, what you see here we have the, the basically I have the segmented left ventricle in red. 
but again, this is uh, one uh, sort of like uh, one view looking at the heart in the long axis. Uh, when we want to, uh, or when we want the, the, the physicians, uh, basically they prescribe the cardiac MR and then the patient goes to, to the MR scanner, what they do to have a more accurate measurement of the volume, basically as you see here, uh, imagine that, you know, so that uh, long axis is cut or sectioned uh, perpendicular to this long axis. So we have different, different uh, slices. As you see here, uh, like these are the short axis slices. So technically, imagine that you're looking at the heart, at this, this cross-sectional view, and you're seeing all these images. So basically, in the, the most apical point of view here, this is the, like, more to the tip of the heart. And then as we go further up, we have all these, uh, all these different short axis views. They, they call it short axis. So uh, the, again, you see red left ventricle, green the, 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 basically the muscle uh, that, that helps pump the blood out, and then yellow right ventricle. And then the, from epical to most basal slices. Again, what we have here, we have the end diastolic phase when the heart is at, the, at its biggest uh, volume, and then the, the, the end systolic phase at, at its smallest volume. But so why did we talk about all this? So basically, this is the healthcare. What, what the physicians need to, to make accurate decisions on, you know, so like about the, that heart failure. So they need to basically contour, go one, once the, the images are out from the scanner, go it in each different time point, end diastolic and systolic, go for if the, each different slice of the image, and then contour uh, that uh, left ventricle, right ventricle to get at the, at the end to, to basically, once you have these contours, you can calculate the area multiplied by the thickness of the slice, you have the volume for that the slice, sum it through all the slices, and then now you have the volume for the left ventricle. So how, how long does it take? Imagine we have like maybe, for example, eight millimeter or one, one centimeter slice thickness, so we have like 10 or eight to 10 slices here. 10 slices, two phases, we have 20, 20 images that they, they need to go through them, contour them properly. So almost like uh, what, what we have to, to accurately contour them, 20 minutes uh, contouring time. So what we wanted to do at Circle, and this uh, project that started last year, was to, to use deep learning, uh, machine learning algorithms, to, to basically automate this. Uh, I, I think it's a kind of a fair assumption to, that, you know, so uh, everyone here, we have heard about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, but uh, usually it's also like, you know, so challenging sometimes to say, well, so, okay, what, uh, you know, so what, what people ask me, so what is the difference between artificial intelligence? So the way I look at it is basically this, this is schematic from NVIDIA that uh, artificial intelligence basically has been around since 1950s, the, the whole idea of having, having the, the, that, that, uh, the, the, the intelligence. And then the machine learning, a, a tool, to, to reach artificial intelligence, again, has been around for like uh, more uh, from the, the earliest stages of uh, the idea of artificial intelligence. Deep learning, uh, again, a nested uh, sort of tools under machine learning that uh, has, has been extremely uh, shown, uh, sh proved its performance and accuracy since uh, around 2012. And the reason that uh, they, they are more, you know, so now, now uh, you know, so uh, like this, uh, we are more going towards that is to have more, uh, more sensors, basically more data, and at the same time more computation power. Uh, but this is how I, I, I see it, what, what we had basically. So we have uh, access to big data through our, our sites that have already installed our software uh, for, for all these years. So we have uh, had uh, thousands of uh, studies that basically then some experts, they have uh, gone through them and contoured them, annotated them uh, manually. So we have the left ventricle, uh, the blood pool, you see that red circle, that's like where the blood is for that, uh, that single view. That green is the basically, or basic, any, anything between red and green is the cardiac muscle, and yellow is the right ventricle. And then we have these contours for, for thousands and thousands of images. What we wanted to do is to basically feed that, uh, the images plus the contours, the annotation to the, to the brain, which is the, the, the deep learning architecture and then uh, the, the hope is that uh, that architecture learns uh, the, the association the pattern the mapping between the images and contours and comes back and you know so when when we have the image without the contour we are hoping that we can pass it to the to the trained algorithm and we get the contours and actually in this case it did a really good job so um, what, what we use basically we use the semantic segmentation algorithm so uh, it's a some sort of convolutional neural network basically each neuron is connected to some chunk of uh, pixels in the in the image 
And then as we go, uh, we go deeper and deeper uh, we, with the downsampling, basically the, the, the pooling, uh, we, we get to, uh, to the, the each, the, the activation is more uh, representing more abstract, uh, abstract features of the, of the images. Uh, once we, we get to the, to the most, so here to the, to the mo most dense layer, we kind of, again, uh, combine all those, uh, all those activations and then uh, we uh, combine them to get a pixel-wise prediction. And then we, uh, every time we uh, compare that prediction with the ground truth that is coming from the expert, we have the contours, we have the mass, we compare that. Uh, the comparison gives us the, the error. We back propagate the error throughout the whole system, update the weights, and then come back again. Uh, this has been done uh, like, um, so there are, you know, so if we count them, so here we have, for example, in this, the, the architecture we use, we have 17 million parameters. So there are 17 million parameters there that they start uh, randomly in the, in the beginning of this whole thing. And the goal is that once you go and pass images uh, millions of times, then all these weights are adjusted uh, that basically the, this pixel-wise prediction is close as close as possible to the expert uh, segmentation. So how did we uh, evaluate our technique? Basically what, what we did, uh, we had a subset of images that uh, 50, 50 uh, cases that three individual, three experts annotated them based on the, some, some sort of uh, standard operating procedure. So three experts annotated the data. Each of them did that twice. So for each person, we have two sorts of contours or annotations. And then we have also our machine trained to, to contour the data. We need some sort of metric. So for semantic, for segmentation problems, uh, one, one matrix that is being used uh, uh, is the dice index. So uh, to, to think about that dice is basically if you have two circles, if they have complete overlap to, to each other, we have a dice or overlap of one. And if there is a the mis, uh, mis overlap or they're totally off each other, that's the dice of zero. So basically a number or a measure between zero to one showing the overlap between the, the contours. Uh, and then we have also the clinical measures, uh, basically from the, the, the contours coming from the expert. We have the end diastolic volume and systolic volume. We can calculate that from the machine. We can also calculate all those values and then compare the machine to the, to the, to the expert. In terms of performance, when we look at the basically intra-observer variability, one person contouring one single data twice. So I go contour it, close the data set, go back next day, contour it again. Uh, if I do it twice, or that expert uh, following the same, like one standard operating procedure, SOP, uh, for left ventricle endo, or that basically the red contour that you're seeing there, uh, this, this red contour, they get around 97% 90, uh, accuracy or overlap. And then the, this, this, uh, this range shows, you know, so that 50 different people, what is the range? So basically there were people that uh, to themselves, they had 90% overlap and then some people that more closer to 100%. But for me, it's more also interesting to look at this trend. Basically what I'm seeing here is that uh, this, this myocardium basically is the muscle. Anything between red and green is the hardest task for for those clinicians uh, to, to get that. And this kind of makes sense. So basically, if you have a full circle or uh, that disc type of thing, it's easier to, to segment. When we go from end diastolic, when the, the cardiac or the, the heart is at biggest uh, volume to, to the end systolic, when it's at, uh, at its smallest volume, basically the task gets harder. You see here we have 97% accuracy. It goes to 95% accuracy. Uh, but then again, another trend is that myocardium in end systolic gets, gets easier task for, for the human. And that also uh, I interpreted in the, in the way that basically the muscle in end systolic phase is, is thicker. So it's easier task to segment a thicker muscle. So the trend makes sense. When we look at the inter-observer variabilities, those three experts uh, following that standard operating procedure, uh, again, the same, the same trend numbers a little bit lower uh, than intra-observer variability, but still, you know, so we have a good overlap between those people. But now uh, we start thinking, okay, so how, how does that machine how, uh, work, uh, the, this deep learning trained algorithm? Uh, the machine basically it's, it's perfect in intra-observer variability. You, you uh, take the machine, feed the same images twice, it gives you the same answers. So there is no reason to look at the intra-observer intra variability for the machine, but when you look at the intra-observer variability, what, what we saw, so this is the accuracy of our technique, that um, basically we are close, 
uh, this is extremely good. We are so close to the, to the range that when you ask uh, two, two different, three different people contour the, the, the studies or segment the studies following a standard procedure, the, the, we, we are close to their, that, uh, that accuracy. The, the nicer thing is also that um, the, the, the same task that is, uh, that is harder for the, for the human to do is also hard for the machine to do. Uh, this is also justified in the way that uh, when, when you think about it, uh, we have annotation, annotated data. The annotation comes from the expert. So if you have some task that is harder for the, the, to the expert to do it, there is more variability in the data set. There is more variability in the annotation. Then the machine learns less. That's why it's uh, harder for the machine to do. Uh, so again, uh, in terms of performance, uh, so what we have started thinking is that did we answer everything or is it still like more, more challenging uh, questions or where, where is it that we are failing? So then we came up to this, uh, this idea of the generated contour. So basically any dice or, uh, or uh, the overlap less than 70%, we called it the generated dice. Um, and then we have started looking how, how frequent does it happen in different regions of, the, of the, that, that heart that I, I showed you in the beginning. Is it happening in the more like the mid-ventricular mid slices when you, you have that, as you see here in this middle image, the, the full circle? Or does it happen more toward the, the apex of the heart when the, 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 those circles are smaller or toward more the base of the heart when you have all the valve and everything connecting? When we looked at the, the, the frequency, we saw that, okay, so for me, the slice is basically less than even 1% uh, frequency of having a dice or uh, that overlap less than 70%. So we are almost like we can say perfect in those mid slices. But when we go to basal and epical slices, we get to see more, uh, more degeneration or basically 6.4 and 10.7. That's the, that's the maximum degenerated uh, frequency that we have. Again, this is also uh, close or what, what we see also for the clinicians. Epical slices, basal slices, is always, always hard, harder for them also to, to annotate. Uh, the, 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 the good point or the, is that so epical slices, uh, we are having a smaller uh, contour. So basically, they, the, 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 uh, the contribution of those contours in the volume, that is what the, the clinician and the end is, is interested in, is, uh, is basically negligible. We, we went further in and said, okay, so uh, now if we want to break it, uh, this degeneration to, to left ventricle, the myocardium, basically the muscle and right ventricle, when is it that is more challenging? And again, we see that it's uh, similar to what is more challenging for the expert. Uh, right ventricle is a challenging task. Uh, but uh, so what, what we did, and you know, so this is a, the, an interesting or uh, a ch challenge in uh, AR, I would say, in, in deep learning, is that you, you you take a study, a sample a study, uh, what we had was healthy control subjects. So you, you take it, you, the, you train a machine, and it works in, in that, for, for that sample of studies. But the, the main question is that how does it work? How does it perform in a, in a real world uh, uh, situation when we have different uh, data sets coming from different scanners? There are different vendors, uh, GE, Siemens, the Philips, there are different vendors. The images look uh, not, not totally different. There is the heart there, but the, the, the signal intensity is everything is different. How does it work there? How does it work in different pathologies? We have HCM, like hypertrophy, cardiomyopathy, and I, I won't go to the details, so, so like some sort of uh, right ventricle abnormality. Does it work as good in, in different uh, pathological cases? So to, to answer that question, we went uh, and found this, this the challenge online that basically they have 100 uh, data sets available uh, for 20 normal uh, controls and then 20 for each uh, four different pathologies basically. And then uh, we started looking at the using the, the, the machine trained on the healthy control data, of course with some sort of like data augmentation and normalization, everything that we did in house. And then we looked at the dice uh, for different, different pathologies. And uh, again, uh, interestingly, uh, this, uh, I should say, you know, so this is not the first result that we get. So basically, the first time we train it, we, we look at this uh, graph, and then the, the accuracy drops for some sort of pathologies, and there are always like challenges, and we, we come back and introduce some sort of augmentation, normalization. And uh, at the end, so we are almost to the, to the point that you see, if you start comparing that red, uh, red, uh, red bar, uh, for the left ventricle, basically all that blood pool, the accuracy doesn't drop from the normal cases to the to the pathology. And for the like, basically here for the end systolic um, uh, volume, uh, when the heart is at this uh, smallest uh, volume, for 
some sort of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have the most drop there. Uh, so the, the last, uh, or one, the, yeah. So again, so we talked about the DICE index, the geometric, the geometrical uh, index to, to look at the, uh, basically the, the accuracy. Uh, now, if we go back and look at the, the, the clinical metrics, uh, we have the end diastolic volume, systolic volume, a stroke volume for left ventricle and right ventricle. What we have here for the convolutional neural network, I have the numbers reported, and for the manual contours, the expert contours, we have them. If you look at the mean difference for left ventricle, we are almost close to zero, zero milliliter uh, mean difference with the, the RS square of 96, 0 0.96, and then the, the interclass correlation of 0 0.98. So basically, we are uh, uh, correlated enough, and uh, the, there is no bias to the to the um, to the contours uh, f uh, coming from the expert in terms of left ventricle. In right ventricle, again, almost uh, 0 0.94 uh, uh, or 95 intraclass correlation, but with uh, some sort of 3.5 milliliter volume difference uh, average in uh, end diastolic volume and systolic volume for right ventricle. We, you can say that's negligible in terms of like 130 milliliter. So, uh, so what we did, we trained an algorithm that uh, the, the trends of the, the accuracy shows uh, similarity to the, to the human being. Uh, the, the gain is that it's accurate. There is no, uh, basically, you, you, there is no intra uh, observer variability. And then if you, uh, basically, because it's trained on one sort of standard operating procedure, it will do or follow that all the time. It's not like uh, technicians that, you know, so you have this trained on some sort of contouring, the other one some, some other way of contouring. They, they have different, maybe they, like, one will miss a basal slice, one will miss the epical slice. The machine will always do what it has been learned. And then in terms of timing, uh, what I, I talked about was, basically around 19 min minutes for the, for the expert to contour uh, that 20 slices of images. And for the machine, it takes only seconds to, to contour. I think I'm, uh, yeah, uh, I don't have time anymore. But I like for, for maybe like a uh, quick uh, thing here. So this is our software running. And if I delete, so these all the, 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 the contours here. So this, what, what you're seeing here is, again, like a short access. Uh, image of the heart, so basically you, you can run here. So in, in like this, this uh, the, in one column we have the, the, the phases. So we have phases here. Oh, sorry. So now I don't see anything. So here, so for each column we have the basically the the the. the uh, the w each phase of the images, and as we go here, we have different uh, slices of the images. And if uh, I press this button, which is our machine learning contour detection, it will just take a. few seconds and here. So it automatically detected that this is basically the smallest volume of the heart, this is the, the biggest volume here, and then contoured all those images as you're seeing here. And uh, we also reported the end diastolic volume and systolic volume, the stroke volume of the heart and everything. So this is the, yeah. For the training, you mean? Uh, no, you said that you, you trained it on, on data that you guys annotated and then had some other... Yeah, the test set was uh, actually from a challenge online from Mikai, the, the, the machine uh, or medical imaging conference. Uh, in uh, So Mikai 2017, last year, the test set is called, the challenge is called ACDC. So you can just search online ACDC challenge. Uh, you will find 100 cases of annotated data. So to the other, yeah. So uh, 
Yeah, so in the beginning, basically, the, no. So we, we trained on that, uh, the, the annotated d data that was coming from the same center, the same scanner. And then the first time we deployed on, you know, so in, in real life situations, it doesn't work. But then you need to go back and then maybe try to, to find what are the variabilities in your data. So is it something that you can take it, like model it? or uh, to, to basically take it out from your data or something that you can't model. For example, one, 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 one case uh, that was funny. So usually you don't expect images coming from the scanner to be mirrored. And then when we, we got that ACDC data set, so the images were mirrored because they, they, they changed the basically some sort of the, the, the DICOM format is the, 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 the data that basically we are working with and our software is working with is the standard format because they transferred it using some other tools. It wasn't the standard format, everything was mirrored. You test it there, it doesn't work. Uh, now, yeah, for that a specific example, we don't need to really do anything because in real life situation, images shouldn't be really mirrored. Uh, but what you can also do is go back in your training time uh, take your images, 50% probability, and now I start mirroring them. And then your, your algorithm now will start learning that, okay, not all the, the hard images are like this. They can also be like this. So, yeah, we have to go back and then start annotating or uh, augmenting data technically. Yeah.